Welcome back, everybody. Let's continue to discuss this chapter on conformity, but this time let's kick the pressure up a notch. And in the next several sections, let's discuss compliance. And along the way this time, we'll talk about mindlessness and the norm of reciprocity and how they help explain compliance. Previously, we talked about conformity. And whereas conformity focuses on unspoken, often unstated group norms, compliance is different because it focuses on our reactions to a person's direct requests. So with this topic of compliance, we're talking about some additional social pressure. Specifically, compliance refers to changes in our actual behaviors that are a result of some direct requests that someone has made of us. So like we've talked about previously, if we're going to talk about changes in people's behaviors, we would need to know how someone would have acted without that additional pressure. As we discuss compliance to specific direct requests, think about some of the requests that you hear on a daily basis. They often start out with something like, hey, can you do me a favor? Uh, sometimes people are interested in collecting money, for example, and they might like say, hey, are you interested in donating $10 to the United Way? In these next several sections, we're interested in talking about factors that make you either more or less likely to comply with those requests. Over the years, most of us have developed some strategies for gaining the compliance of others. So think about yourself. What kind of strategies do you use? How do you tend to exert your own influence? There are some really common strategies when we want something from someone else. It's obviously pretty common to simply be polite. Some people you'll notice though are a little bit more threatening and that could be because they have some type of position of authority or for some reason we see them as an authority figure. Oftentimes we just reason things out and we give people a good strong case for why they should comply. Sometimes we elicit some emotional strategies. We might pout. Um, depending on the relationship that we have with someone, we might try to kind of seduce them or offer them some other favors. In general, effective strategies for gaining the compliance of others are going to depend on a variety of different factors. For example, one factor would be our basic relationship with that target person. If the person's not very well known, it's likely that we'll want to simply be polite because that's what's common in our society. That's what we would expect when we're asking a favor of others. But of course, if that target person is our spouse, we might use some playful seduction. Or if the target person is one of our friends, we might offer some other type of favor in exchange for their compliance. The strategies that we use also depend quite a bit on the culture where we live and on our personalities. You know, I'm probably not going to pull off seduction very well, but I'm able to reason just as well as any other person. And that's why that's a strategy that I often rely upon. Of course, the specific nature of our request is an important factor as well. If I just need you to donate $5 to my favorite charity, I might use one strategy. But if I need you to donate a kidney to save my life, I'm probably going to rely on a completely different strategy altogether. So in order to gain somebody's compliance, there are a variety of different strategies that we can use. And the strategies that we decide to use are dependent on a variety of different factors. Next, you're going to see that some people comply with our requests almost automatically. That could be nice. Well, why would people comply with our requests automatically? That's where the topic of mindlessness enters this conversation. And mindlessness is really very interesting. The bottom line is this, we don't always process information very carefully. And in fact, when it comes to making requests from someone else, researchers have found that the way you actually ask for something can be more important than what you actually ask for. I'll demonstrate that basic point by sharing with you the results of a very well-known classic research study. Imagine this type of situation. A confederate is trained to go up to people who are using a copy machine, and nobody likes to have anybody else ask them to step in front of them when they're using a copy machine, but that's exactly what this confederate did. And the experimenters manipulated the way the confederate asked the question, the way the confederate made the request. Sometimes the Confederate simply said, may I use the Xerox machine, implying that he wanted to step in front of the person actually using it. And sometimes, though, the Confederate phrased the question in a more traditional way, because when we make a request of somebody, we typically want to hear why you're making that request. What's the reason? So sometimes the Confederate said, may I use the Xerox machine because I'm in a rush? 
So it's not really surprising that in this situation, fewer people allowed the Confederate to step in front of them when he simply asked to use the copy machine instead of when he said, because I'm in a rush. In that situation, almost all the people complied. But this is where things got really interesting. There was a third condition. Sometimes the Confederate went up to the person using the copy machine and he said, may I use the copy machine because I need to make some copies. If you think about it, that third situation is essentially identical to the first situation because in both situations, it's pretty obvious the people need to make copies. The Confederate needs to make some copies. It's in that third situation though that the request is structured like a typical request where I'm asking for something and I'm providing you with the reason. And even though those situations are fundamentally the same, except for the way the request is posed, in that third situation, about 93% of the people complied and let the Confederate step in front of them. So what we're learning from this is that the mere appearance of some genuine reason increases compliance. We can see in that third situation, the person didn't really have a genuine reason, but it seemed like the person was providing some genuine reason simply because the person's request was formatted like a typical request that has a reason associated with it. I guess the bottom line is that we often comply with requests relatively mindlessly without fully processing the information that's behind the initial request. This research is fascinating, and in fact it's interesting that this mindless mindset that we've been talking about can also somewhat harden us and that can make us more likely to reject some of the common requests that we hear on a daily or regular basis. Let me give you an example. If you have traveled to a larger city, you've probably had to deal with panhandlers. And although you're probably a generous person, you can't give money to everybody. You just might not have the money on you. So you develop a relatively mindless response. Somebody makes eye contact with you, they approach you, they ask you if you have any spare change, and you just say, no, I'm sorry, I don't have any spare change, or I'm sorry, I can't help you today, without really even thinking about it. But some crafty researchers have found that they can disrupt that mindlessness, disrupt that knee-jerk response, by asking the question in a way that is not typical. So for example, imagine that a confederate is walking up to people and panhandling, asking them for money. It's very common that someone might say, can you spare a quarter? And in that situation, that mindless knee-jerk response is likely to come out and you're likely to say, no, I'm sorry, I don't have anything to give you today. However, imagine that the Confederate comes up to you and asks, hey, do you have 17 cents that I can have? Now you're, you're thinking like 17 cents, it just seems like such an odd request. And that odd request serves to disrupt our relatively automatic, relatively mindless reaction to refuse to donate. And it makes us somewhat more likely to see that situation and view that situation more thoughtfully, think it out, and we'll be more likely in that situation to comply. I'm not often in a situation where I'm asking people for a lot of help, but I have been in the past, and I've used a technique that's really kind of interesting. So the whole idea is I'm trying to disrupt that relatively knee-jerk, mindless response to say, no, I don't have time to help you. So imagine that I need to go to the airport and I might say like, hey, would you mind driving me halfway to the airport? That's a really strange request. So instead of that mindless response, simply saying, I'm sorry, I'm not available, people now want to engage me in a conversation. Like, why are you just going halfway to the airport? And it's at that point that I've already won this battle. Because then I'll explain to them, well, I actually do need to go all the way to the airport. I don't want to put you out. So maybe if you can just drive me halfway, then I can kind of hitchhike or, or find another ride at that point. Because I'll be in Columbus, there will be more people around, more people can help me. And at that point, the person's more likely to say like, well, I mean, I, I'm sure I can probably just take you all the way. The whole point is that we're trying to disrupt that initial mindless response. And when you do so you're more likely to find people who will comply with your requests. Next, let's discuss some other reasons that people might comply with your requests. So other than out of mindlessness, why might people comply with our requests? Sometimes we just simply feel obligated. Imagine a situation like this. This guy wants this lady to go out on a date with him. So he's really nice to her and he brings her some flowers. And what he's hoping is that she's going to reciprocate. 
If he's going to be nice and he's going to give her something, he's hoping that in return, she'll be nice and she'll give him something, which is saying yes to his invitation. Now, of course, not all guys execute that plan very effectively, but my point is that the norm of reciprocity, which is a very strong, typically unspoken social norm, it pressures us to treat other people as they have treated us. And keep this in mind, it works on the positive side and on the negative side. So if somebody's nice to us, we want to reciprocate and be nice to them. But if someone's mean to us, like this guy in this picture, we're likely to reciprocate that negative affect. We often call that negative affect reciprocity. But keep this important thing in mind. That pressure to reciprocate based on that norm of reciprocity is relatively short-lived for relatively small favors. So you've all probably gone to a store where you've received some type of free sample. In this situation, this lady is receiving a free sample of some soy milk and she's drinking it and she's probably enjoying it and she'll say thank you and they'll share a smile. And now she feels he was really nice to me. This company was really nice to me. They gave me something for free. To some extent, she's gonna feel some pressure to do something nice in return. And what's the nice thing to do? Pick up a half gallon of the soy milk and buy it. Now, just because she received that free sample, it doesn't mean she's gonna buy the milk, but she is more likely to buy the milk. That's the whole point. But let's say she doesn't buy the milk, all right? So she's still feeling that norm of reciprocity and she has not acted on it. How long is that going to last? Well, let's assume that she goes and she picks up the rest of her items and then she goes to check out. And now the cashier asks her if she wants to upgrade her membership. Keep in mind, they just did some nice things for her. That store just gave her some free samples. Is she likely now to upgrade her membership because she feels some type of pressure to do something nice in return? Well, probably not so much. Small favors don't really leave us feeling obligated for very long. Now let's compare that with some relatively big favors. Think about your parents. Our parents have taken care of us for decades and over that time, they have earned what we call reciprocity credits. In other words, under the norm of reciprocity, we owe them and we owe them big time. And because that relationship with our parents is often so important and because they've taken care of us for so many years, it's likely that that obligation from that norm of reciprocity will endure for a long time. Well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon. <laughs>